this is a great opportunity to look at the vibrant high-tech sector in Israel uh, that uh, is responding in its own way and has needs and, and problems of its own in, the light, in light of this, of this crisis. To, to, to open the conversation, I want to invite our dear friend and board member Terry Castle to say a few words. I would just say one thing about Terry, uh, that she was an invaluable resource for Jeff N as we navigated the tough decisions we had to do in light of the crisis. So I use the opportunity to thank you, Terry, again for your for your support uh, during that during that process. And um, as as probably you know, the Paul Lee Singer Foundation is uh, the brain and the heart behind the Startup Nation Central, which is an organization that supports the high tech ecosystem in Israel and has been a driving force of its growth and of its development, not just in Israel, but around the world. So without further ado, Terry, floor is yours. Well, the screen is yours, rather. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And I hope everyone's feeling sheltered and safe on the call. Uh, Eugene Candle is a um, PhD professor from Hebrew University and served in the um, Bibi administration for over six years um, as his national economic advisor. And we were lucky enough for Eugene to decide to join us um, five or six years ago at this point. And he has a very unique perspective on what's happening in Israel, how the economy will be impacted. And largely the economy in Israel is driven by the high-tech sector. There are lots of other things going on in Israel, but probably 80, 90% of the GDP of Israel is, um, is based or, or, or is connected to the high-tech sector. So we're worried about a number of different things that the coronavirus um, will impact. And Eugene is in a position because he's on the ground in Israel and he's talking to the entrepreneurs and the innovators. And most importantly, he's also talking to the government about what kind of relief, what kind of opportunity sets and what kinds of challenges the high tech sector in Israel will be experiencing and is experiencing. So I'd ask Eugene to sort of take it away and give us some insight on Israeli um, companies doing the work to help us get through this virus um, and other opportunities that might create an, um, some ideas for investors um, as well as um, uh, people who just want to be informed. But Israel has specific needs and everybody on this call is interested in the survival and flourishing of the Israeli economy. So I didn't turn it over to you, Eugene, because Eugene actually has the knowledge that will be useful for this call. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Andres. Uh, good morning, good, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, and I hope that wherever you are, you're safe and healthy, and we'll continue to be so. Um, what I wanted to do in, a, in about 20 minutes, uh, to go very quickly through this presentation, um, that's going to talk about a bit about economic implications of this crisis, especially focused on the ecosystem here, and the innovation technological ecosystem. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about corona-related projects that we're doing at SNC together with many partners. And if we have time, or maybe during Q&A, we can talk about the day after how we see it and how we are working to prepare for the day after um, that we can potentially launch together. Um, a few, few notes about uh, sort of the economic implications. We're in for a prolonged lockdown of various stages. It's not probably for any of you who's following the news and following the deliberations. Um, we've been in touch um, over the last two days, just to give you an example, with Israeli government, with Indian government, and with the Inter-American Development Bank. Everybody is struggling with the question, how do you release the economy? And uh, in all those cases, nobody really knows. 
and there is a continuous trade-off between the med medical issues and the economic issues, and these are very uncomfortable, but they have to be um, made. Uh, the initial supply side shock that we saw uh, will be followed by a longer demand side adjustment. Um, the projections for the, this year growth is uh, between minus four to minus 10%, depending on the country, depending on the medical conditions. Uh, we're going into this with limited effectiveness of monetary and fiscal policies in many places, Europe, United States. So that makes it more difficult. Uh, monetary uh, um, tools are not, not very effective. And uh, they're big, uh, uh, we're still bearing the big um, deficits from the 2008. Some sectors have been decimated completely and will take a very long time to, to recover. In the short run, something very relevant for Israeli tech is that the foreign investors and in Israel, they are very, very important. In 2019, they counted for over 85% of all the um, venture investments are basically contracting into their local markets and will not show up here for quite a few months, maybe a year. So uh, economic implications for Israel, we're already at 25% unemployment, uh, even though Spain has been living with this for a while, and Israel is un unfathomable uh, to people that, and it may be rising quite rapidly after Passover because a lot of people were hesitant to lay off workers before Passover. There's a general market instability, contracts at risk, there is a ter terms of payments are changing, people taking basically law in their own hands and deciding which contracts they're going to honor, which not. There is a lack of trust in the government. There is um, uh, limits on, on the government after the third elections and with the possibility of the fourth, this is not an easier way to, 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 to deal with such a situation. The economic and financial position of the country are luckily are very sound because um, uh, we have uh, uh, economic resilience because we are uh, accustomed to dealing with crisis like uh, wars and all kinds of military operations, which helped us to be sort of uh, prepared for various um, extremal situations. And we're in a very good position in terms of debt to GDP ratio. We're about 60%, whereas the developed countries on average are above 90. So we have some leeway to accommodate the crisis. Uh, but there is a growing frustration of citizens. Uh, Israel in introduced a complete curfew uh, about an hour ago for the next two and a half days in order to prevent uh, gatherings uh, around Passover table. Uh, we didn't, we, you know, there's, a, there's compliance on some parts of citizens and not, you know, much lower compliance on others. And so there's basically a completely infer enforced curfew um, as, as of now. Uh, so the high tech uh, last year was a record year. Uh, the eight and a half billion dollars, a growth of 40% over 2018 of VC investments. Uh, there is in the first two months were uh, the first quarter is actually a record quarter, 2.4 billion billion dollars of of, uh, of investments, and then it completely frozen. Uh, there is an expectation of between 20 and 100% loss of revenues in Q2, depending on your industry. Uh, and so since foreign investors that uh, represent the majority of late stage investments for a lot of Israeli VCs and angels are disappearing, and they're not going to likely to come uh, for a year, that means that the local money, uh, or local investors have to carry the companies in their portfolio for a much longer time. And so what they're doing essentially is saying, wait a minute, I have X amount of money. I thought that I'm gonna spend it over two years. Now I'm gonna to have to spend it over three years. I'm going to um, be very careful how I'm gonna spend it. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to A, stop new investments. Two, I'm going to cut companies, which I thought were good a month ago, but if I have to cut something, these are the companies I'm gonna cut. They could be Forex companies that will bring you know, incredibly high returns. But if I have 10x companies and I have to choose, I'm going to cut the 4x companies. And I'm going to take my remaining companies and tell them to, uh, to cut costs. So their runway, the, the time that they can run on, on the money that they have and my money will be much longer than we, we, we thought. 
And so that could yield massive layoffs. You know, it's, it's really ironic that a month and a half ago, we had 60 articles when we issued a report on the shortages of human capital. Many of you heard me uh, speaking about this. It was an acute problem a month and a half ago. Today, the acute problem is massive layoffs in this industry, and what do we do with all these people? So this is a long-term threat to the industry. In fact, uh, uh, it needs help because it's a, basically it's a liquidity crisis. Uh, but the question is, will it get help? Well, uh, about a week ago, I wasn't yet sure. Today, I'm much more sure because I'm after extensive consultations with the, with the budget department. They're actually rolling out a, a package of support for the industry. I'm very happy to, to say that. Uh, but it's actually not very popular in the public because this industry is considered to be a rich industry, highly paid, and so they're saying, why, why can't they take care of themselves? At the same time, of course, this is the driver, like Terry said, this is the driver of the growth for this economy, and so losing it will be devastating. So what do we do in, in this space? Uh, we actually, as SNC, we looked around uh, almost immediately after we sort of got accustomed to working uh, uh, long distance. And we said, what can we do in this, in this space? And we said, there are two things that we can do. A, we need to uh, figure out how to help uh, the ecosystem itself to weather this storm. And two, how we can help the world uh, with uh, the technologies that the ecosystem produces. And so we've started doing both things in parallel. Um, one of the things that we immediately constructed is um, what this, you can see this map. This map is two weeks old, it's out of date completely. So this is only 70 companies in Israel that are uh, relevant for health tech for Corona. Today there are already 90 companies that are relevant because Israeli companies are very quick to pivot. And uh, we have been uh, uh, propagating this, this information around the world, especially around specific companies that we took and we think that can be helpful in a variety of ways to government, healthcare organizations, uh, and uh, philanthropists or whoever is interested in helping. Um, uh, just to, so in addition to these companies, there is another set of companies that are relevant for privacy protection, all other things that are related to what we do because of Corona, and not specifically for Corona, but they're no less important. So just to, to give you an example, last, uh, last Thursday, uh, we publicized several, several um, developments in Israel and how they're using technology to, to help deal with Corona. It was published in over 100 articles in 30 countries. So we took upon ourselves publicizing and promoting to other countries the solutions. Some of them are actually for free. This is not uh, using necessarily using this to promote the Israeli economy, even though you know long term it's definitely going to help. But just to give you an example, like I said, we we had a discussion with the Indian government and connected them to to several. Uh, uh, solutions we had to this afternoon. I had a discussion with the president of uh, Inter-American Development Bank, who is thinking about already implementing two Israeli solutions to 26 countries in his region, <clears throat> and he wants to do much, much more. So that's that part is is very important. We're continuously doing these uh, press releases and 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 pushing not SNC but the solutions to a variety. I just got off 10 minutes ago, I got off an interview with Wall Street Journal that is trying to understand what kind of solutions are, are of interest here. The other side that we're doing is to, crea to creating a source of knowledge for anybody who is interested in the triangle that has corona, Israel, and tech somehow correlated. Uh, so I'm happy to announce that today, we launched after about 10 day, very, very extensive work. Uh, we launched a Corona Tech uh, website that is, um, is still in its beta, uh, beta format and it's uh, working on uh, 
uh, on several audiences. So it's an audience of uh, anybody who's interested what's going on in Israel, uh, so mostly Jewish audiences, and et cetera. Uh, journalists, corporations that are interested in solutions, governments, uh, and of course startups. So there's, uh, I'm, uh, we're going to, uh, we're happy to send you the um, uh, the URL, and we would be very happy if you can contribute uh, in a variety of ways uh, to to the, the information. It's purely informational uh, website. Uh, we are running all kinds of um, in-depth interviews with players, stakeholders in the system to understand the writing white papers, passing them on to the government, participating in various government um, consultation groups. Uh, so I've already talked about Corona Tech site. Uh, you can you can see what what's in it. Uh, we also, since we cannot bring our clients, our corporate and government clients, to Israel to do our our trademark engagements, uh, we decided to start doing them um, much more online. So we are working with uh, clients that have. Uh, bandwidth to talk to us that they're not completely swamped some clients approach us um, uh, on their own trying to find solutions we have roughly once a week uh, and it's going to become more uh, events online dealing with various uh, aspects whatever the clients need and we're trying to figure out ways to make our online engagements more exciting because this is where we're going to go many more we believe that over time, many more of our offerings will be done online because companies just realized that they can do online much more than they ever thought about. And so extensive travel is probably going to be curtailed. We're doing, uh, we're partnering with uh, Digital Israel, which is a government agency, uh, with IBM and others to uh, take to take advantage of this idle time that people uh, have uh, on their hands when they sit at home, uh, including students, including uh, high-tech uh, workers that have been uh, temporarily put on, on leave, and trying to retrain them, upskill them, and as well as bring some people who otherwise would not go and train to come into the high-tech industry, uh, to really uh, reskill re, uh, re themselves, because we know that once this crisis is over, we're going to go back to the shortage of human capital. We would like to to prepare these people for much more uh, interesting and, and productive careers, especially from areas which are not going to recover, like travel and hospitality uh, and uh, maybe um, restaurants, etc., which are not coming back anytime soon. Uh, I already mentioned that we are very involved in policy. Uh, uh, in terms of policy, we do uh, a variety of things. Like I said, uh, uh, we are uh, gathering opinions on, the, uh, on what's going on in the industry. We are advising the government today. Uh, we saw sort of confidentially some of the things that the government's going to roll out. Uh, we can definitely see our our um, uh, stamp on those. We, we our influence on those. Uh, we um, we also involved in designing technology driven solutions for managing epidemics. Uh, so the playbook for the next round of of uh, of uh, uh, of this pandemic uh, and uh, because. Uh, what happened for many governments, including Israeli government, is that we came into this into this pandemic without a clear playbook, and uh, and in that in in because of that, the technology was not used early enough to to really uh, help uh, contain this uh, um, this spread, and we don't want to be caught again uh, with the same thing. Uh, we are trying to think about survival um, as a new sector. Not a sector, but in the new new area in which uh, governments will want to invest heavily in corporations that would like I said would require a lot of technology to to um, to to deal with it uh, uh, so these are our uh, our areas and the final thing that the day after and I might 
just mention a few. I think that the governments, uh, unlike the last two decade, decades that uh, were witnessing basically reducing the government to consultative um, uh, position, that the government, the minute it was elected, everybody wanted to give it their opinion and it was supposed somehow to take these opinions and, and implement them instead of leading, it became obvious that in situations of life and death, governments must be able to govern. And they need to govern in an effective and efficient, not effective way, not efficient is less important at this stage in, in the crisis. And I'm actually uh, um, think that if the government learn that this is a dry run for a much more severe test of a pandemic that is spread much faster and much more lethal, um, can be an incredible service that God Almighty gave us. Because last time he gave us something like this, we basically ignored it in 2009 with bovine flu. And um, the second thing that we see is that the globalization is a uh, is a, uh, I would say, almost a cult. Uh, and I'm not saying it's as a bad word, but it was followed uh, almost religiously, um, is likely to go on to hit breaks quite significantly. There's much more nationalism and anti-immigration that was already showing its head. But because of the fact that majority of cases were coming from outside the countries, it will fuel it. More polarized world that will become much more protectionist and it will be driven no, not less by the firm's unwillingness to, to have very long supply chains, a very, foc very uh, localized supply chains in countries which can cut these supply chains off in one day. You, I don't need to tell you that 18% of all the um, ingredients in every medicine that we consume is made in China. So basically, if China closes its doors for any reason tomorrow, we basically can't have any medicines. That, that, is, a, that is a realization that is not new, but it's just no longer acceptable. And it's going to be less uh, emphasis on climate change uh, because governments will not have uh, money to do that, and as well as uh, SDGs, uh, whether it's good or bad, uh, uh, I'm not passing a value judgment about this. It's probably bad in the long term, but it's probably going to be our, you know, reality for the next few years. Uh, the day after, in terms of world economy, there will be dramatic changes. I already talked about this in the way we work, study, travel, consume healthcare, leisure, entertainment. And in all of them, there will be much more demand for remote technological solutions, for cyber protection of these solutions, and for new ways, AR, VR, interactively interact, sort of interact with each other without being close. That is actually pretty good news for, for Israeli tech. Localized supply chains will lead to an increase in manufacturing costs because you're basically, A, creating two uh, sites for your supply, uh, which is costly, and B, you are basically moving your supply chains from cheap countries to expensive countries. This would drive the demand for robotics and production productivity enhancing measures, which is, again, good news for Industry 4.0, uh, and all kinds of um, new manufacturing, which is, again, reasonably good news for Israel. And there's going to be a drastic reduction of travel, which is going to create huge labor force change because transportation, hotels, uh, real estate industries are the most uh, labor-intensive industries anywhere. And so uh, we're going to have to retrain uh, hundreds of thousands of millions of people in, in every country. And this has to be done online because otherwise it's just prohibitively costly. So this is again interesting. Um, and the last part about the Israeli ecosystem. Uh, so localization and protectionism are not good news for an export economy like Israel. 
Uh, we may count on favorite nation status in the U.S., so that may be uh, good because it's our biggest market, but Europe, which is our second biggest market and almost the, exactly the same, uh, I'm not sure. It's not even clear whether Europe will survive as one entity because the pressures that almost tore it apart during 2008 and 2011 Greek, Greek crisis might actually tear it apart today because there will be very, very different uh, needs of different countries. U.S.-China um, tensions may have effect on Israeli tech if we are put in the middle of it. Um, I already said that, uh, on the other hand, we have opportunities both in AI, cyber, industry 4.0, digital tech, health, agri-tech, because all these will go, uh, with demand for these will go, uh, will go up. So we are here to, to help figure out, you know, we didn't know much about this a month ago. We are now much smarter about this, uh, gathering as much information, as much knowledge, as much insights about what's going on, trying to figure out how to help the ecosystem. We are happy for any partnership that we can have in ideas and uh, contacts, et cetera. So that's, that's basically it. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. That was, that was fascinating. And actually, it makes me think of, of, um, of a phrase from the Talmud that says, Miu chacham molad, who is wise, the one who sees a process when it's, before it's being born. And, and you are seeing a processes in the long term uh, that, are, that, are, that, are, that are being born just now, but you're seeing it with a, with a clarity that is admirable and this is not prophecy, things may not unfold exactly as you say, but uh, it's really important to have folks like you thinking about alternative futures that we may face, we may face in, the day, in the days ahead. So I'm gonna ask you just a few questions and then we're gonna open it up for, for folks um, in, the, in the audience to, to ask their own questions. But I wanna start by, by this, um, you know, COVID is, you know, I compared it earlier on to an earthquake and a tsunami. You know, COVID is the earthquake, the economic disruption is the tsunami that comes after the earthquake. So can you tell me, can you tell us one example of a, a company that is dealing with the earthquake and a company that is dealing with, that is, that is prepared to deal with the tsunami that will come after, for folks to understand concretely what these technologies can do? Well, I think, I think that uh, I would separate uh, because tsunami is going to be economic downturn. And I don't think that um, dealing with tsunami is, uh, uh, is, techno is technology is particularly helpful because these are mostly governments, etc. But within that tsunami, there will be a lot of challenges that companies will face and some challenges that governments will face and technology could be useful for those. And so I'll, let me give you a few examples. So first let's talk about the earthquake. So uh, in the earthquake, you need to figure out first of all, how to, you know, understand where the earthquake is gonna ruin your, your cities. And it's a slow earthquake. It, it's not just the erupts and, and that's it. It's, it's, uh, it's like almost more like a volcano eruption. You'd need to predict in which direction it's going to go so you can evacuate people. And there are companies in a variety of areas that are helping, first of all, in terms of data and identification. So one, one uh, it's not even a company. It's just a bunch of people that got together and, and didn't sleep for three weeks and put together a, an app that allows you to install it on your, on your um, telephone. It's called the Shield. Uh, in the first three days, more than a million and a half Israelis installed it. It basically tells you whether you were uh, in the vicinity of somebody who was infected. And it does it on you without compromising your privacy because it does it on your, on your, um, on your telephone but it connects your telephone constantly with the database. And this database can be either electronic monitoring through cell phones, et cetera, of 
corona, corona infected people, either today or 14 days back. Or it could be if the country that doesn't monitor it, doesn't monitor electronically, it could be just the epidemiological map that every healthcare system does once they uh, once they get their hands on the on the patient. So uh, this is something that is extremely uh, useful because it keeps you peace of mind that you were not, um, and it, it tells you that in the last three days we checked your positioning four times. You were not found. Would you like us to test it for the next four days? And you say yes. If you say no, that's it. If you say yes, then it continues to work in background. You don't have to do anything. So this is something that is open code, and we're giving it to other countries for free. So already I think about six or seven countries, including Italy and Germany and Australia and Chile, uh, that requested it. Diagnostic Robotics, which is a company by somebody you may know by name Kira Radinsky, uh, they basically doing heat maps using surveys and helping the uh, Magen Davida Dome, which is, uh, you know, the ambulances, to go to places where they're more likely to find people that, that rather than having a common flu, having a corona. So this is very, very important because of scarcity of resources. A company that is uh, called Early Sense that allows uh, distant monitoring of people. It's basically a device that you put under a mattress of a patient and it monitors their breathing, their heart rate, et cetera, uh, and transmits this data without anybody having to, to, to approach the patient not to get infected. Similarly, there's a much smaller company. Uh, they saw their sales, uh, I think, double in the last uh, week. Uh, company called uh, er, uh, Pulse and more, which has the world's smallest uh, ultrasound, which was initially designed for pregnant women not to go to the hospital with every uh, worry that they have. And they ba it's basically an, an attachment to your cell phone, which you put in a, against your abdomen, and it shows the doctor what goes on inside there. Now they just repositioned within a week and started doing tests on checking uh, what goes on in your lungs. And it's extremely, lungs. extremely important because it's the only thing that doctors today can use on severe patients because the, you can't do CT, you can't do X-ray, you can't do anything because the equipment will be sabotaged if you bring it to a corona patient. And so they basically fly blind. There's a variety of companies that deal with big data we deal with remote uh, handling of care, triage, um, but there are also companies that deal with uh, with loneliness. So companies that deal with, especially with uh, people, uh, elderly people, uh, like a companion, which has AI and interacts with you, initiates conversation, reminds you to take pills, plays music, connects you to your children and grandchildren, all kinds of things. This is a company that launched about a year ago, and it's been, uh, it's been uh, helping a lot of people. Uh, and also there's companies, uh, surprisingly, there are companies that, whose sales are growing rapidly. These are companies for leisure. So Joytunes, one of the companies that teaching you how to play music on your, on your phone or your computer, uh, their sales went through the roof because people have a lot of time. EduTech has educational technologies. So it's quite, quite interesting to see, just to sh an interesting fact that when we started the map three weeks ago, we saw 45 companies that are relevant to Corona. Today we have 150. And it's not that we became very open to introduce just you know, window dressing. No, these companies pivoted in the last three weeks. Yeah, just just talking about that. I mean, I have a lot of questions here, and, and I'm getting some questions in the Q and A that I'm going to ask you as we as we continue. I mean, one of the one of the questions that that I have, and I guess many philanthropists and actually private investors may have, is you know, and I'm going to put it I'm going to put it in in somehow blunt terms, is how do you distinguish what's real from the snake oil sellers? You know, like there could be now people that say, oh, I have a solution for this and it's, it's half-baked and, you know, who, who, do you want, who do you ask to know if these people are serious, if what they're saying is true, if the technology is sound, etc. 
Well, there are, there are, there are, first of all, I think there are three um, categories. Um, there are smoke and mirrors, uh, which we try to eliminate, not to, not to, not to sh show them, but, but, you know, we're not 100% sure. Uh, people who, are, who deliberately mislead you, I think, are relatively rare in this ecosystem because it's pretty professional, so it, it, it smells them out pretty quickly. They don't, they don't grow to, to later stages. There are, of course, very dangerous uh, technologies that have, you know, high probability of failure. They have less dangerous, and then they have already proven technologies. Yeah, risky, so, not dangerous. Well, risky, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. Sorry, you're, you're yeah. of course right. So the question is whether if the investor has a lot of expertise in particular technological field, then I think that investor can figure that out. But if the investor can, does not have expertise, we strongly recommend not to venture into direct investment into small companies unless you co-investing with somebody you trust who has expertise in that space and did due diligence. And so, uh, but having said that, we believe that today investing in Israeli tech uh, and I would say cross the board as a portfolio, even if the many companies will fail, is an incredible opportunity, and I'll explain why. Because uh, as I mentioned, the value of Israeli tech has uh, increased because it will more, be more needed after this crisis than it was needed before. No. But the valuation of Israeli tech has declined because for two reasons. A, the go-to-market timing was increased by about a year, at least. So that that makes it you know less valuable to, today, and it actually rewards patient investors. And the second thing is that there are many fewer investors today in this market, and they're much more cash constrained. So the deals that would have gone to Sequoias of the world and Kleiner Perkins of the world today can go to Israeli investors, but Israeli investors are, are cash constrained because they have to spread their cash much more carefully. So if you co-invest with them in a variety of forms, and that's what we are actually arguing for the Israeli institutional investors and even Israeli government, then you have lower valuation today and higher valuations uh, in the future and access to deals. So this is the ultimate situation which has unbelievable uh, double bottom line because it basically helps Israeli economy through helping all these companies become much more mature in a year, two, three, four. And the second thing that it helps is that it actually can create uh, returns to impact investors and philanthropic investors which can be spent on good things. So. It's it's a great it's a great uh, time to to invest in my opinion. Great, that's that's very helpful. And um, one of the things that I, that I was thinking as I was hearing you is that you know we have a lot of folks at the JSN network that are interested or have an extensive work in impact investing, and many of the Israeli companies were not considered truly impact investing. You know, impact investing are which ones in which your mission sort of overrides your 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 desire to make profit are you willing to sacrifice short term profit for you know fulfilling a philanthropic goal but now it appears that many companies that wouldn't wouldn't have been considered impact in the past or in a normal situation could be considered impact now because their situation became precarious and the technologies that they're developing became much more important to, to solve the crisis or to help in the crisis. Do you that? Yeah, I think that you're absolutely right. We actually started thinking about impact investors as a potentially a very interesting group for Israeli tech. But the problem with, is, with, with impact investment is that when we showcase in our Finder platform so almost 6,500 companies and another 500 companies that we have that are in stealth mode, uh, impact investor cannot go and use their irregular tools to go through every company and figure out whether they have impact or not. So what we decided to do, and we launched it 
I think about three months ago, uh, um, we created an SDG uh, tag within Finder where we did uh, uh, an automated it, algorithm that went through it, explain, all... Sorry, explain what's an SDG. SDG is these uh, sustainable development goals uh, for, okay. for, for uh, the UN Sustainable 17 Sustainable Development Goals. We created a relatively simple algorithm, which we hope to improve in the future when we get to it, that basically goes through 7,000 companies, uh, or 6,500 companies, and identifies about 500 of those that it's worthwhile for an impact investor to look at. And if, especially if the impact investor is interested, let's say, in financial inclusion, then they can put FinTech as one tag and SDG another tag, and they will get probably 40, 50 companies. Uh, and then it's much more manageable for them because we already pre-screened them for them. So that's one thing. And I strongly encourage anybody who is interested in this to either look at Finder or to contact us, and we would be happy to walk them through it. Now, but you're absolutely right that uh, once Corona hit, a whole bunch of companies that were not even looking at this world, suddenly pivoting and becoming uh, relevant companies because just because they're helping the world to deal with this, not only now, but in the future, because like I said, it's a dry run for future, for future survival uh, uh, real real time events, and so if we if uh, if we we'll look at these companies, I think out of these 150 companies on that list that is called coronavirus on Finder, or we we just put them all on Corona Tech website. Um, these uh, these almost all of them, or vast majority of them, except the gaming ones, are 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 also impact because. Um, uh, and I think that uh, more and more uh, companies, if impact investors come to Israel and start looking for them, and we can publicize them, that will bring more and more companies to pivot and start looking for impact, not as a window dressing, but as a real, uh, real uh, concern, a real uh, um, t t t target. Uh, because they will understand that this will bring them investments and they could be doing good and by doing well as well. That's great. Um, that's very helpful. Um, one, of the, one of the comments that, that I'm saying, and I'm talking here also as a parent who's uh, dealing with this, uh, is distance learning, right? And, and things that were thought of, you know, well, one day, one day we'll try distance learning. Right, and there were all sort of issues, economic and and, uh, and and social, and you know resistance. Uh, you know, the, finan the the financial model of distance learning was a problem, but so there was a lot of resistance to get head on into the into the world of distance learning. Um, and now <laughs> we're seeing that everybody's doing distance learning. So uh, this is going to be a huge accelerator, I, I think. Um, how, how do you see, and again, this is not prophecy, but, but how do you see the future of distance learning? And especially if you see any, any utility for both of community who try to do deep engagement over you know, virtual, virtual tools. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, I think that it may be, uh, if we are lucky, the biggest positive economic impact of, uh, of this um, crisis on Israel will be a dramatic change in Israeli educational system. Because um, I have the privilege of being uh, someone who helped introduce the first online course into Israeli education system without even intending to do so. This was financial education back in 2011. Um, but, um, but the system was very, very opposed. It's a very, very conservative system that says only the teachers standing in front of uh, a group of students, just like they did 150 years ago, um, is, a, 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 is a way to teach. It's, it's unbelievable that every other aspect of our lives underwent change 
This is the only area which is exactly the same as 150 years ago, with some bells and whistles around it. Well, at least, at least in many cases in Israel. And I think that if this uh, crisis changes this by showing that children can learn no less well, and in some cases much better, because you can put, if you live in Dimona, in south of Israel, you will never put the best teacher in front of these kids in the classroom. It's just never going to happen. Or Eilat, or Arab village, or, or Kiryat Shmona. Uh, not even Be'er Sheva, probably. Uh, but you can put the best teacher in the country, or the 10 best teachers in the country in front of these students, anywhere they are, online. And if you create an environment which is accepting this and con converting teachers into basically teaching assistants and mentors the, whose, whose goal, whose role is to educate and help children solve their problems which they have in a very, very customized and person-specific way, we're going to see an incredible change in this country. The second thing is that EduTech has a very long history in Israel. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with CET. Uh, this is the um, Center for Educational Technologies, which was established by Rothschild uh, family in 1970 and has been a leader in Israel and in many other places in terms of uh, developing innovative methods of teaching, including online. Uh, you know, virtual, uh, virtual high school has helped many, many students in Israel already in the last six years to, to get um, access to high-level math and physics where there are no teachers in high-level math and physics. Uh, there is, they have accelerators. There's a bunch of companies, probably 50, 60 companies in that space, maybe even more by now. We looked at this space to try to promote it. It didn't have critical mass. But I hope that now it will, because the technology uh, is there, the uh, innovation is there, but there was no demand, and because of no demand, there was no investment. And so I hope, certainly hope, for, my, for the sake of my grandchildren, which are not born yet, that we're going to get a dramatic change in this space, and it's, it's a very, very exciting space to, to, to be.